welcome to another episode. What are you reading? What are you writing? I am Karen E. Osborne, your host. I am the author of Getting It Right, Tangled Lies, which is a murder mystery that came out last year, and The Brand New Reckoning. It's this year's novel. And my guest today is David B. Seaburn. And you're going to find out all about him. He is, uh, he's a professor and a family therapist and an author. And he has eight novels. And the ninth is coming out in December, which he's going to tell us about number eight and nine. And, uh, and also he has, has years of publishing creative nonfiction, of being published with his creative nonfiction. So, you know, we've had some nonfiction writers on this show, and but now in David, we have both. Hey, David. <laughs> hey, how are you doing, Karen? Good to see you. It's good to see you. I am having a very good day, and I hope you Great. are too. Yes, we are. We have nice weather here today. Good, good. And I hope all of you are having a good day. So, David, you know, your writing journey has been very interesting um, as you've come through. Uh, tell us, tell us about the how you approached your writing journey and how you ended up in the novel business. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, kind of circuitous. I, uh, um, I think I really wasn't until I was in seminary in Boston at Boston University that I really began to think about language, words, and how we create with them. And this is really from studying uh, a lot of Old Testament. So I learned about the power of language to make meaning through mm -hmm. stories, which mm -hmm. captured my uh, interest from the very beginning. Um, I served a church for six years, but then moved into the mental health field, became a marriage and family therapist. And so I've had more than 30 years of listening to stories of uh, ordinary folks uh, dealing with uh, extraordinary circumstances. And also there's a lot, believe it or not, in a family, narrative theory is a major part of family therapy these days, the idea of, of use of language to make meaning and all of that kind of thing. So that uh, bolstered my uh, thoughts about the importance of stories and storytelling. On the writing side, I did a lot of academic writing. I published over 60 um, journal articles and two books. And uh, I think what, I mean, I learned the discipline of writing. I learned to think mm. as a writer. Uh, I learned to get used to having uh, editors um, accept or reject uh, what I've written or make suggestions <laughs> about what to do with it. Uh, and how to do a long project, because as you know, writing a novel, you, you, when you sit down and write that first line, you're going to be friends with that story for a long time. Usually it's about a year and a half for me. Um, so I think that that really got my muscles uh, toned to, be, to branch out to other kinds of writing. So I started to do some uh, uh, creative nonfiction um, in particularly in a psychotherapy magazine called uh, the Psychotherapy Networker and um, published, oh, I don't know, eight or nine pieces there over the years. And I think that because I was writing characters, fictionalizing real situations mm. and using dialogue and things like that began to become comfortable. But I never felt that fiction was in my wheelhouse, to be quite honest. Oh, why not? But, what, what, what made you think that? Well, it's simple. I mean, I could come up with ideas, but then I couldn't figure out where they were going to go or how they were going to end. And it, it, I didn't realize until I started writing that I don't have to know where it's going to go and how it's going to end. That's why you write. Um, exactly. And your days, characters will take you all kinds of places anyway, even right. when you think you know where it's going. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So in night, actually in 1990, uh, I got the idea for a novel from an experience with a uh, client of mine. And I wrote all the notes and had the same thing happen and uh, thought I can't go anywhere with this because I didn't know what to do with it. And so I kept the notes for uh, 10 years. And um, uh, then I read the, the, I think it was the novel, The Book of Ruth, and which is a first person novel. Whenever I was reading that, I thought, I think I could, I think I could do this. I think I could write this in a first person way. And so I started in about, 2001 writing the first novel and it uh, 
Yeah, it's called Darkness is as Light, and it came out in 2005. And then I've been, you know, writing cons consistently now for, you know, a little over two, uh, 20 years. So uh, uh, that's how it started. Yeah, that's quite a journey. So I'm very impressed that you have two, two books, uh, one out already, right? That came out last year. Yeah. And then you have another one coming out this year. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's first talk about uh, the, novel, the novel that's out now, right? It's um, Broken Pieces of God. Just give us uh, just, a, just a snippet of what it's like. Yeah. The, um, it's about a, a family, as usual. Uh, husband and wife uh, in their middle age, sons and daughters living in other states dealing with what it means to be in your 20s uh, and trying to work and find your way. And I wrote it in multiple points of view. So you get oh. a sense of everybody's perspective on just about everything. The wife has recently been diagnosed with ovarian cancer and the husband uh, also just got laid off from work as his company was bought by bought out by somebody else or another company has taken over the um, company that he worked for. Um, and the son and daughter, I won't get into all their struggles, but one of the main things is they share a significant tragic secret <laughs> from whenever they were in high school, which eventually comes up in the story as well. So uh, it's really a story about how ordinary people deal with extraordinary circumstances. And in this case, you're following the husband who becomes uh, uh, enamored with a statue of Jesus in a nearby church and goes there, although he doesn't go to church, to kind of meditate. And the wife, uh, for her uh, side of things, starts to figure out a way to uh, defraud the IRS out of enough money for them to <laughs> retire comfortably. So you have both ends of the spectrum in that one. That's a cool, that's very cool. And you're, and you're drawing on both your seminary life and you're drawing on your family therapy life, you know, because we do write what we know. Right, <laughs> that's what, exactly. That's, what, that's exactly. what we write. So yeah. now you have a book coming out in time, yeah. for, in time for Christmas, people, time in time to buy a great book and give it to lots, you know, buy lots of them and give them as presents. So tell <laughs> us about the book that's coming out in December. Well, this one is called Give Me Shelter. And I actually did not anticipate it coming out this year. I really thought it would be next year, but uh, I got things done early and got them in. And so it's coming out this year. Whenever after Broken Pieces of God, usually pretty quickly afterwards, within the next month or so, I start writing something else while the other novels going through all the things that go through before publication. And at that time that I was starting this one, um, you know, the pande pandemic was really raging. And I thought mm -hmm. everybody's going to be writing something that's focused on the, the oppressiveness of the pandemic. And I thought, I really don't want to do that, but I would like to write about something that has that kind of theme to it. And the first thing came to mind uh, whenever I was growing up, 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And for me, as a, as a, uh, 12 year old, it was extraordinarily frightening and it seemed to just hover over everything. Uh, and so I took that as a, as a first idea. And then from there, uh, I came up with, you know, he has an older brother who's leaving to go to college. He's in sixth grade. The brother is going to be a freshman and they're being raised by the grandfather. Uh, so the, the other story is what happened to the mom and dad who have died? All the boys were ever told because they were little was that it was in an accident, but they never knew exactly what happened. So you have both of these things evolving uh, down the track, so to speak, and the kind of merging towards the end of the story. And in some ways, it's a, as I think of it, it wasn't intended this way, but I think it's kind of a coming of age story, uh, particularly for the uh, 12 year old, the 17 year old kind of going out in the world for the first time. And there are two other. Uh, preteen kids involved in this uh, uh, as well. Um, and for the grandfather, it's kind of letting, letting the oldest grandson uh, depart and also deal with uh, the impact of the loss of his wife, which I won't get into, as well as the parents of his grandsons. Mm, yeah, now, that's the, very the, intriguing. <laughs> I should say, these are heavy, but my books have a lot of humor in them. Uh, I, I, 
really like to use humor because that's part of who I am. And uh, it, it kind of comes out naturally in the way I write. So despite some of the uh, heft of the themes, um, the, the writing also has a lot of a lot of humor, which I've gotten a lot of good feedback about. So I'm glad about that. Yes, that I admire. I have, uh, it's so funny because when I do my public speaking, I incorporate humor all the time and I yeah. make people laugh. But as a writer, I have a hard time with humor. So I'm going to look forward to learning from your, from reading your books because I'd, I'd like to get better at incorporating uh, humor in, in my books. Yeah. Um, my, my stories are, it deal with heavy subjects as well. So yeah. instead of throwing in humor, which I'm not good at, I throw in sex. <laughs> what can I say? Well, you know? <laughs> I'll trade you. How would that be? <laughs> you can take my topic and I'll take your topic. <laughs> Pretty good. Well, you know, you do uh, approach these, these kind of what you call heavy uh, topics. What do you want your readers to come away with after reading your stories? You know, what do you want them to either think or learn or feel? That's a good question. And uh, each time I have an interview, a question like that comes up. And, and so it, the answer has evolved, believe it or not, because mm, I- No, you know, I believe it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think simply put that life is, is, a, uh, is a challenge and hope is something that you do together with other people. Mm. Uh, so each of these stories have common elements uh, and common themes around uh, loss, um, dealing with uh, the, the exigencies of time, uh, dealing with difficulties in relationships, the kind of things that, uh, that if I knocked on the doors of everybody in my neighborhood and they were to tell me about their lives, they would be they would probably have experienced. And so how do you make your way? What gives you the substance internally to be able to keep going? And how do relationships help contribute to maintaining a sense of hope? Hope. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Like that a lot. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is, what are you reading? What are you mm -hmm. writing? So we have mm -hmm. to talk about reading as okay. well. Yeah. So the first question I'd like um to ask you about is about your ideal reading experience. Like, are you the curl up on the couch kind of guy? Are you an audio listener? Are you, uh, what, what, what do you do? Read when you're doing on the treadmill? <laughs> what, what's well, it's your interesting. ideal reading? I, my ideal reading uh, situation and what I actually do are two different things. My uh -huh. idea, especially since it's summertime, my ideal is to go out on the back deck by the pool and uh, sit under the umbrella, have a nice iced tea or something, and just read. And I go out with that intention. My wife comes out to read as well. I, I have that intention every time I go out there, but I never end up reading. I just start to relax, enjoy the trees in the background, and get into the pool, talk with my wife, relax some more. So when all said and done, my reading is really at bedtime, uh, and I like to make sure that I have you know, half an hour or so where I'm all set. I got the pillows stacked up behind me. I got the book that I'm uh, reading uh, right now. And uh, actually right now I'm reading, uh, uh, which I'd never read before, The Bell Jar by, uh, 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 geez, I'm blocking on the author, uh, which I hadn't read and was so uh, such a big story when whenever I, I was graduating college, it came out in 1972. So I, I thought I'll just, I want to read this and I'm enjoying it very much. Um, so my, that's my, my, my ideal reading circumstance and my actual reading circumstance are two different things, but. <laughs> yeah, the reading at night, um, you know, that was something that as a kid I did all yeah. the time. And my yeah. parents would say, you know, lights out. And I would just pull the covers up, right. <laughs> have my flashlight. And our grandson is visiting, our number two grandson is visiting us today. And there he is. I said, it's, you have to go to sleep. Can I just read for 20 minutes? 20 minutes, Grammy. Okay. And he's got his books on his nightstand. So read, night reading, I think, is a, something a lot of us do or have experienced. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful that he wants to read that much. You know, Oh, that's... he reads. He reads constantly. Yeah, I, We ask him to go someplace with us. 
And he says, how long is it going to be? Because I have to know how many books I should bring. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any um, books that you could recommend to our I, audience? I have actually have authors that I would recommend. Okay. Anything cool. written by these authors. And Sylvia Plath is the author that I was blocking on, on the Belgium. Yes. Yeah. I think anything uh, written by Jasmine Ward is uh, uh, yes. really, I mean, she, I don't even know how to put into words what she's able to do with language and how she tells a story and how she gets at what the life experience of her characters is really like. And it's mm -hmm. enlightening and enraging and sad and hopeful all, all at the si yes, same time. Yes, I love her. Yeah, she's really remarkable. I mean, I, I'm yeah. waiting for her fourth book. Or she's won awards for the first three, and I mean, big awards, National Book Award, and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really like her. Colson Whitehead is another one who I uh, yeah. really yeah. am enamored with, uh, and um, um, read. Uh, I think the last three of his books. I've, I've uh, really. And he's really unbelievably versatile. He just goes mm -hmm. in different directions and and locks into whatever topic uh, catches his fancy. Um, Alice McDermott is uh, another writer that I really like. And um, I think of her as a quiet writer. She, the novel I always think about is called Someone. I and I, I love the book and nothing happens in this book. <laughs> it oh. follows this woman kind of a whole course of her life till old age and just how she's had to deal with well, difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. And you really get uh, caught up in who she is and you know what's out ahead for her. And the language is, is really beautiful. George Saunders is another one that I really like. His uh, Lincoln in the Bardo is a fabulous book. And his short stories are, you should read his short stories. There's a lot of speculative stuff in there. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, uh, I think the last short story collection was called December 18th, I think is was what it was. Whenever I read him, I can't write like him and that's not my area, but I, I feel like, wow, you can do anything. Yes. <laughs> you, you, yes. Can, you can actually do anything because he's that creative. Um, yeah, I, Marilyn, I, really, I find it's really great to, uh, to read different genres. Yeah. You know, that then that's just sticking in one's own own genre so that's really good i cut you off though so you have one more that you'd like to recommend james mcbride is another one who i really uh really like he's uh pretty special and uh once again can kind of speak to reality in in a significant way yes i would agree i would yeah. agree those are excellent choices i Thank hope you. you guys were taking notes while david was talking to us you were jotting down the authors that he recommended and that you will not only look at some of those wonderful authors, but you will check out David and check out his uh, book from last year and his book coming out this year. Do you have a copy of, of um, either book? Do you have a cover copy you could show? Um, I have, this is Broken Pieces of God. Whoops, let me get back. Oh, nice cover. Very and, uh, nice. Give me shelter doesn't uh we aren't quite you're still working on that, that one. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. That takes it takes time, people. It takes time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's looking good. It's it's looking good. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining. Oh, but where can our audience find you? Uh at uh, uh David B. Seaburn, all one word dot com. That was, David that's my website. B. Seaburn. Dot com. Dot com. Okay, check them out, check them out. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, both David and I, thank you for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time on What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? And tell us what you're reading. We'd love to hear from you. Take care, everybody.